Hi, my name is Science with Chris, and today I'm going to be going over a presentation I gave on my OBGYN AI, and the presentation was focusing on nerve injuries in gynecologic procedures. So to start off, I wanted to first focus on the prevalence and the importance of this topic. So lower extremity neuropathy is found in what percentage of gynecologic surgeries? So out of every 100, it's found to be 2% of the gynecologic surgeries are associated with this. Most of them are sensory and 90% do resolve uh, within weeks to months. So to orient ourselves to what I'm going to be talking about, I want to give a brief orientation for the different nerves. Starting from the 2 o'clock position, I have my iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, down to the femoral, we have our lateral femoral cutaneous, as well as our sacral distribution, followed up by our genital femoral, as well as femoral nerve. Going further down outside of the pelvic region, we have the nerve uh, nerve pathways, um, specifically on the left side is the anterior view, and the right side is the posterior view of the sciatic nerve, and how it bifurcates off is the common peroneal around the popliteal region. And finally, we have our lumbosacral sensation distribution. So paying close attention to the anterior femoral cutaneous distribution in green, the purple, which is lateral femoral cutaneous, as well as the genital femoral, ilioinguinal, and obturator regions. And finally, here is the nerve, the origin, and its respective motor and sensory functions. This is... Um, going to be important as I go through the different surgical procedures because it'll help us understand what pathology might be associated with lesions of the iliohypogastric or stretching of the sciatic nerve. So this will help give us a reference viewpoint on what to assess if we are suspecting certain injuries. So to start off with, we have our surgical complications this is the way I broke it down so that it's by procedure, not really by nerve. So in regards to using self-retaining retractors, this is like the book wall, the book Walter, and you can see this in certain procedures, potentially like an open abdominal hysterectomy. So to orient ourselves to how I've structured the next set of slides, on the left, underneath the title, I have the nerves that are going to be associated with certain uh, potential injuries, uh, maybe a point about that specific nerve. On the right, I'll have an image, and in the lower portion, either on the right or the left side, I'll have the nerve, motor, and sensory function chart. And on the bottom, I'll usually have some, some association with prevention or treatment um, associated with the specific injuries. So for this specific slide, I wanted to go and talk about um, retaining retractors. And the way this works is when you put your blades in um, that hold back the muscle, its, intent, its intention is to hold back the rectus abdominis muscle. But it's possible that in patients who have low BMI or um, aggressive procedure types, you can be putting this blade a little bit further down and you can be pushing and spreading the psoas muscle. And as you can tell, each of the nerves, the femoral, genital femoral, and lateral femoral cutaneous, I'll have some association with the psoas, and I have listed it there appropriately. And so if you press on the psoas too more, you can get this neurotemesis and cause certain sensory or motor dysfunctions. And those are going to correspond with the chart I have on the bottom right. So the way it reads is if you, you can you can then push your blade too far, and if you compress the lateral portion, lateral border of the psoas muscle, you might be hitting your lateral femoral cutaneous which is going to have a pathology of decreased sensation on the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh. So that's kind of how it reads. Um, you can kind of read the other nerves and how those work. The prevention technique for this um, is ensuring that you're not retracting the psoas. And if you do have thin patients, you can possibly fold a lap towel in order to um, not have that directly contacting the psoas muscle. It's important to note that femoral nerve injuries um, make, 11, make up 11% of all gynecologic neuropathies. The next, the next procedure I have is a pelvic sidewall dissection. There are a few um, encounters that you'll have this procedure. You could have it for lymph node dissections 
tumor excisions, endometrial resections. And the way this works is um, you're just working on the sidewall and you can kind of impact either the obturator nerve or the genitofemoral nerve. And I've listed the sensory function at the bottom. Interestingly, if you transect the obturator nerve, you can actually have very, very good possibility of return to function if you just go back and re-ligate them. And specifically, if you are uh, the genital femoral nerve, you have to be careful about, especially if you are doing like an external iliac node removal. So just make sure to be careful about that. So sacrospinous ligament fixation. This is the next procedure. This is going to be um, common for procedures that are uh, for urinary incontinence, like for SUI and such. And the nerve here that we're worried about is pudendal nerve. And the pudendal nerve runs on the lateral third aspect of the sacrospinous ligament, which is which is uh, colored in blue in the picture. Sorry, the colored in green. And uh, the pudendal nerve exits the sciatic foramen and it is associated if it's in, if it's uh, affected. You can have a perineal and vulvar pain, which is noted to be worse when sitting. And um, like the operator nerve in the previous example, you can actually decompress this nerve even two years post-op, and you can still get beneficial outcomes. The next uh, surgical procedure is more of a positioning for the patient, and this is dorsal lithotomy. There are three different types of lithotomy. There's high, standard, and low. And in particular, this is referring to the amount of flexion the hip is experiencing. So in high lithotomy, you're having a high degree of hip flexion. The picture on the right is showing candy canes that are holding up the legs. You can also have boots as well. It depends on what your institution uses. But um, when you have this extended hip flexion, and I'm going to be talking about the femoral and lateral femoral cutaneous nerves, those nerves pass underneath the inguinal ligament. And when you have this hip flexion, you have possibilities of decreasing like blood flow and nerve sensation because it's being compressed underneath that, such, that rigid inguinal ligament structure. So that's how you can get those pathologies on the anterior aspect. Um, but on the posterior aspect, you have your sciatic, which branches off into a common fibular or a common peroneal and the tibial nerve. And the way this works is, so the sciatic nerve goes out of the greater sciatic foramen, and then it goes through the greater sciatic notch and travels around the, travels down the posterior aspect of the leg, or posterior aspect of the thigh. Now, this is a pretty rigid structure, so when you're putting your legs in high flexion, uh, in, in, yeah, in a high, hip flexion, in a high lithotomy, you can experience stretching of the sciatic nerve. And... This is where you can experience these pathologies. Um, on the bottom, I've written the general issues with sciatic nerve uh, pathology, which would be like decreased perineal function as well as dorsiflexion and foot inversion. Now you can also have it when you're putting up in a high lithotomy. Um, if they have the lateral aspect of their legs pressing on either the candy canes or one of the uh, people in the operating room is resting on the lateral aspect of the leg, you can uh, kind of cause the same pathology in the common fibular nerve. As I explained earlier in this video, the common fibular nerve, um, you know, bifurcates in the popliteal region of both legs and wraps around the fibula traveling down the leg. So there is an opportunity where the arrows are pointing to, quote, incorrect pressure that's where it would be affecting the common fibular nerve. And this is the classic presentation of foot drop in the, uh, in the post-op uh, time period. So you're going to want to assess for any issues with foot drop and issues like that. Um, I bring it up right now because this is the last time I'm going to be discussing the femoral nerve. Um, it's important to check for patellar reflex in these patients. Um, very commonly, you can have a decreased sensory function function. And the easy way to do this is just a simple patellar reflex test. Um, <clears throat> so in this position, as well as if you're using extended period book walter, you're going to want to assess uh, in post-op period for uh, the reflexes, DTRs. The final procedure I want to talk about is transverse incisions. This is most commonly like the fan and steel 
which is like the low transverse C-section that we're familiar with. The nerves most commonly involved in this are the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerve. And these nerves uh, from an anatomical setting pierce through the internal oblique muscle. And they usually are branches that kind of end around the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis. And that's why it's important from a surgical perspective to not extend your incision mark beyond the borders of the rectus abdominis muscle. Because at that point, if you extend it further, you can get issues where you cut or um, damage the iliohypogastric or ilioinguinal. Now, um, this is a pretty common procedure, um, one of the most common in uh, OBGYN, and you have a 3.7% risk of kind of damaging either one of, or both of these nerves. Now, they're purely sensory, though, and you can have different sensory regions for them, specifically the hypogastric, which comes off earlier, um, can affect the upper lateral gluteal region, whereas the ilioinguinal will have decreased sensation in the mons pubis or labia majora. Now, important to note for these procedures as well, um, the pain associated with this, like the entrapment issues, you can uh, the pain will be described as sharp and burning pain. And in order to confirm that this is the cause of the pain, you can use um, an anesthetic injection two centimeters to the inferior medial portion of the ASIS uh, at the depth of the operator muscle. Here's the management. So here is a simple diagram for the assessment for postoperative femoral neuropathy. So if you suspect that's a hematoma or a foreign body or a nerve transection, obviously you're going to want to do your radiographic studies. But if not, then you're thinking maybe retractor, you know, like the book Walter. And the femoral nerve has two distributions, motor and sensory. And with the sensory, if you've been having prolonged uh, failed return to function or symptoms for greater than five days, definitely throw a neuro consult in. Um, the motor deficits you're going to want to assess appropriately as listed on this slide. So for management of nerve injuries, so as I said in the beginning, most of these are going to be sensory. So conservative therapy is usually adequate and most of them will return to function in, week, in weeks to months. If there are hematomas or nerve transections, obviously identify these and fix them surgically because uh, as we saw with the operator in the credendal, um, even that two, two years uh, post-op, you can have a uh, significant improvement in nerve issues. Now, if you have pain associated with this neuropathy, the management for this is SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, or GABA antagonists. An example of a GABA antagonist would be saclofen. And finally, motor impairments are slightly rare, but specifically for this, you would want to do physiotherapy to improve motor function. So future directions for this topic would be including when I was looking at this was when you're putting patients in dorsal lithotomy, is there a difference between putting them in candy canes, which is the picture that I showed, and putting patients up in boots? And there wasn't really a simple or clear example of this that I was able to show like, oh, research shows this or that. But what I was able to find is that there is a current study that's ongoing in the University of Louisville, and it's under Dr. Gupta. And what she is doing is she is was under Dr. Gupta and I guess Dr. Francis. And so Dr. Francis is the PI. And what we're what they're doing is they're looking at um, in vaginal surgeries at the RCT, looking at candy canes versus boot stirrups. And that started in 2018. Right now we are July 2019. And this should be completed in March of 2020. So it's be interesting to see if there is a definite uh, favorite in decreased nerve injuries. Um, but if not, then I guess they're equally effective. That was pretty much it for my presentation. Um, I'm currently in MS4, and this is just one of the small presentations I wanted to give um, to the students, residents, and attendings that are on the floor right there. Um, it's a pretty noticeable uh, presentation for me because uh, I was on the guidance service right now, and I was able to see some vaginal hysterectomies, abdominal hysterectomies, and robotic assisted. So um, it, it tied into a lot of what I was learning this week. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, leave them in the comment section below and I'll be able to happily answer them or engage in discussion. Um, and if you found this video helpful, uh, please click a like and you're more than welcome to subscribe. Thank you.